Here I go. I think I unmuted myself. This week we've been in chapter four of subversive sabbatical or Sabbath and in Leviticus 23, which we read a few moments ago. But I want to begin with the story of what happened to me years ago in Houston, Texas. The Church of the Redeemer was an Anglican church. Uh, it was in a very poor neighborhood downtown uh, in um, Houston. But then suddenly, after its decline and the neighborhood getting worse and the local school with drugs all over the place, um, God touched the church and it came alive and it began to grow. And professionals from the suburbs, it's like going from uh, the uh, British properties to Hastings sort of relationship, all the professionals, the doctors, the lawyers, whoever moved in around the church, the teachers particularly, because they took over the school and the school was transformed. And the doctors and the lawyers had their patients, their clients right in that area. And then the church began to uh, set up uh, food banks, not like handing out food, but they would go out into the country and bring back the best food they could and sell it at the cheapest prices and gave people a sense of dignity. And the whole neighborhood became transformed. That was one part of the story. But the other part of the story was they began to worship in the best of the charismatic vogue. They were an Anglican church, Episcopal in the States, and uh, they had liturgy and they had form, but they interspersed it with stories of miracles, with people sharing their gifts, with dance and drama and all kinds of things. And it was written up in Time magazine. It was on all the news broadcasts. So I went to spend a week there to find out for myself. It probably was one of the greatest weeks of my life in terms of church. And that's the churches I've pastored and the churches I've attended like Southside, but this was a hugely unique experience. I joined them as they went around to the different places in town where people were being transformed. So it wasn't just, we're having a good time on Sunday, we are being the people of God. Let me take you to a Tuesday afternoon. I think I arrived on Sunday. On Tuesday afternoon, I was having tea. Now, I'm not too sure about the crumpets, but I was having something like that uh, in one of the houses. Uh, it was a house that had become a communal house. Everybody had moved into the neighborhood, as I said, but they didn't all live communally, but some did. And I stayed at one of those houses and we were chatting. And then they looked at their watches. It was 4.30. And at 4.30, the church bells began to ring, just like it was some... Anglican village. <clears throat> We've got to go. Oh, okay. Where are you going? We're going down to church. Tuesday night. What do you do Tuesday night? We bring clothing for the poor. We have a potluck together. We learn about worship in the coming week. We share with one another and we just go celebrate. As I went out of the door with a couple people with whom I was staying, I noticed there were lots of other doors opening all around. There were people coming out. And by the time we got closer to the church, which is on a street called Dallas Avenue, it was like everybody streaming forth. And, and we're going to read about that in a few moments in the Song of Ascents, but they were all going together. It wasn't like they were in a huge parking lot and they'd showed up for an hour at church and then they were going home. This was part of their lives. You could tell it, you could feel it. And that's what, of course, we have in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 4. And in the passage that uh, is probably on the screen by now, uh, it says they were all together and they were one heart and they had everything in common. They sold their property and they broke bread together with gladness of heart. That was the spirit of the Church of the Redeemer. And that's what I experienced that afternoon. And I went and I saw food being given out to the poor and clothing and I saw celebration. I saw the choir. You think of an Anglican church or a Catholic church, choir with the robes and the vestments. They didn't have any of that. What they did was they spent time on a Tuesday night teaching the congregation what songs they would learn anew on the Sunday and they practiced them. And then when 
it got to Sunday, and I went to their Sunday worship. Uh, the choir wasn't up there somewhere singing for them. They were in regular clothes, and they would just walk in and out of the congregation, encouraging them to sing. I experienced a lot more that day, a lot of powerful stuff. But I came home from the Church of the Redeemer saying, this is what church ought to be. Why do I tell you that story? I tell you that story because the whole essence was they had experienced community. They had experienced this life together. So that worship became just an extension of who they were. And so we come to the Song of Ascents. They were about 15 Psalms, beginning at 121, in which he constantly talked about the people of God together as a community, going up to Jerusalem to celebrate and to worship God. And you know, at the entrance to one of the gates in the present day Jerusalem is that a sign or that tableau, which you see on your screen, um, it's Psalm 122. I rejoiced with those who said to me, Let's go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That's where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. They go up to praise the name of the Lord. Um, and then in that same psalm is pray for the peace of Jerusalem. When I was asked to, by Cameron, would I do a sermon in this series? I looked it over and I suddenly grasped July 19th because it was about community. I had just, I have just finished about 80 pages or so of, of doing some apps for some commercial uh, outfit about life together, about life, the church as community. And I said then, and so it was a natural for me to want to do this today, I said, when a church experiences community the way it should, it will worship as it should. And when a church worships as it should, it's probably experiencing community as it should. Because what Leviticus is going to tell us, what Christian worship is going to tell us, is it's more than the great service I went to at the Redeemer, dance, drama, etc. You've heard those stories before. But like the Church of the Redeemer, there was this deep sense of community. It was a place to belong, a place to feel accepted, a place to be loved. People didn't go to church, whatever day they went, out of obligation. They wanted to be with each other. They wanted to faithfully serve the Lord together. And I've experienced that at Southside lots of times, particularly, of course, special to me have been those times at Hope where you have that same, I call it, Church of Redeemer sense. Let's go to Leviticus 23, because that was the heart of our studies. It's been read for us this morning, so I don't need to read it again, but look at the emphasis. Verse 2, these are the appointed feasts. These are sacred assemblies. Doesn't sound like individual stuff here. There are six days you may do work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. It's a place where you have a sacred assembly. Chapter, verse four, you have appointed festivals. And again, the word sacred, uh, um, sacred assembly. And then it begins to list all the feasts that take place. There's the Sabbath, of course, and the Passover, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the First Fruits, Festival of Weeks, Festival of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement. The last time, I, in fact, the only time I was in Israel, but it was a special time for me, I was in Capernaum, and it was the Day of Atonement. The night before, I had seen them pouring up to the temple, not the temple, but the, whatever synagogues were around, they'd been pouring up and getting ready for it. Then came that day, and all of Capernaum, was absolutely silent. You know, you've heard of the Christian rapture when everybody gets taken up. You would have thought it had happened. The place was totally, completely silent until about six o'clock at night when the, when the sun set. And then they all celebrated. There are Christian parallels to that. We do that with Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving and Sunday service is supposed to be like that. Christian festivals are like that. But let me read something to you that I wrote because it's about worship. It's about coming together. 
To understand worship is to grasp that it is a community event. It's not something laid on by experts for individuals to experience something like going to a movie. When people experience the wonders and the vitality of worship as it's meant to be, that's community. God's people. Worship is coming together of people who belong to one another and who contribute to one another. All of those festivals, the top of them is the Sabbath. And of course, the name of the book is Subversive Sabbath. And the book doesn't say there's only one way to do Sabbath on one particular day and, and one particular hour. But when God is speaking to them in Leviticus 23, he's basically saying, of all the festivals, of all the days, there is a time to set time apart. Psalm 100 is what happens on the Sabbath. You know, we will enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And First Peter the, in the New Testament speaks about, we are together as a group of priests. So the Sabbath is a special place. It's where they came together. The Sabbath, says Leviticus 23, is a day of rest, a day of sacred assembly. It's fascinating, and I know the Seventh Day Adventists will give me lots of points for this, it's the only um, worship service. It's the only one of these we ought to be with God and with one another. It's the only one in the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now we're going to have to go on and ask questions like, well, what does it really mean? But my emphasis today is not so much on my personal worship and when I personally celebrate Sabbath, and, and that's in the book, but it's on being together with God's people, set aside a day to be together and to worship. Not the only day, but at least a day. And the scripture in Leviticus 23, we don't have time to deal with it now, has all kinds of intricate, inter, intricate preparations that they were to make to get ready for this day. And you know what? That went on in the culture for a long time. I'm gonna give you two incidences, one from Germany, uh, one from England. I'll start with England. That's where I was born and raised. My folks didn't go to church, but um, it was just part of the culture. Like when Good Friday came, uh, you all got new clothes ready to wear on Easter Sunday, about the only time I think we ever did go to church. But that was year after year, there were special clothes, new clothes, new dresses, new suits, whatever, because it was Easter. And um, let me take you to Germany. I had been doing some research in the city of Worms where Martin Luther was, and you don't need that story. But as I was going around and went part of the museum and went into the church and was asking esoteric questions about stuff, um, I said to one of the persons taking me around, where can I get a good restaurant? She said, oh, so-and-so but you'll need to hurry, it's uh, 11.30 already. So what's the hurry? There won't be anybody there at 12. And I went out to look at it. I went outside and at, at 11.55, everybody scrambled and at noon, the whole city, downtown Worms was empty. Because in Germany at that time, and it wasn't that long ago, maybe 15 years ago, they said to themselves, who needs to work? seven hours seven days a week we are going to take saturday afternoon and sunday off whether they worship god or not i'm not not trying to impress you with that so i said well britain didn't do that they haven't done that in north america um they said the people who were most opposed to opening up on sunday and for them opening up on saturday afternoon as well um for tr for years it had this tradition of closing at noon and not opening again till monday morning the people who most oppose it were, were the trade unions. They said, we do not want our people living the kind of life where all you ever do is shop and work. That was fascinating. Another thing that happened in my English culture, I better not spend long on this, move on to more important stuff, was that because you were to get ready for church, which we never went to, as I said, um, then in a very poor area where I was raised, uh, you had to get a bath on Saturday to get ready for church. Well, we did the bathing, but we never went to church. But getting a bath where I lived was a lot of hard work. We would have to take a 
portable sink bathtub uh, off the back wall and off the shed. And we would have to spend hours and hours filling it with water. And the ladies in our house, my mom and my sisters, they would get bath first in the same water. Then it would be poured out and then we'd bathe the guys would get. And, and so that was that. We were getting ready for Sunday, to which we never went. But in the old, old days, in the poor, poor places, the last person to get a bath in that kind of situation was the baby. And so the phrase, don't throw the baby out with the bath water, meant that when the water's been used so much and it's quite murky, before you throw it out, make sure you've taken the baby out. Not important, but it is part of cultures that develop when there was in society, this idea was there's a special day to set aside for worship. Let me go to chapter four of Subversive Sabbath and, and read what was said then that's pertinent to the Sabbath. The Sabbath day is the day when we all together run back home to the presence of God in our sacred lives. Jerusalem on Friday is a whole city coming home, a whole city entering rest. The dynamic is this, the fact that one group of people who live in separate homes are walking together to the same place at the same time. And you know what? That's what I experienced with the Church of the Redeemer. That's what I've experienced in different churches. The Sabbath is about our relationship to God, and it's about also our relationship to one another. If it was just about our relationship to God, then I could go off in a hill somewhere and pray, or I could go walking in the country and say, well, that's church. I've heard that phrase a number of times, and I don't want to get mad about it, but I do want to say the idea of worship, the idea of setting aside a special time, call it a Sabbath or whatever, um, it's not just about ourselves. It's about our relationship with others, and those two things put together cause us to be the people of God. Leviticus 23 makes this crucial connection. There are six days when we may work, but the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest, a day of sacred assembly for the community to gather. We continue even when it's not uh, our best option. A number of times in my growing up, because of my background, um, when I became a Christian, I missed on many opportunities for work because in my mind at that time, I just said, I don't work on the Sabbath. A Sabbath community is where commitment to each other becomes deeper than our commitment to other desires and wants. Um, let's come there to a close. By the time of Jesus, this whole idea of the Sabbath um, had become very complex. Bureaucracy does that. Uh, before you know it, there was a rule that you should keep off the grass and then 10 years later, there's 27 descriptions of grass, 37 different ways that you can keep off the grass and on all the fines imposed if you don't keep off the grass. And so by the time we get to Matthew 12, which was in this week, you have a legalism that had crept in. Jesus does a wonderful healing and the Pharisees said, you can't do that. Well, Jesus said, remember David, his disciples, if you were, followed him around and they were plucking grass. And there's healing, which of you uh, folks who own a sheep or a cat or a dog or anything will not rescue it? Which of you won't do good on the Sabbath? In other words, he was seeing the Sabbath as it was meant to be, not as it had become a legalism. To him, it was an adventure into whatever God could have for us. The great um, irony of Sabbath keeping now, though, is how hard it is for us to say no to people but how easy it is for us to say, uh, yeah, I'm doing something for God. If I say I'm missing this important meeting because um, I've got a relationship, I've got a job, I've got a this, I've got a that, oh yeah, we understand. But if I say something spiritual is why I'm missing the meeting, they may not understand so much. Well, this comes to one of my old goldies. I don't have a hymn to quote this week, but I remember old movies that some of you go, where did he get that from? And I go, probably 20 years before you were born. And one of those movies is Chariots of Fire. The actual story of Eric Liddell is, is a fabulous story. It can be told another time, but a man who gave his life in serving Jesus as a missionary. 
he uh, was born in China and eventually goes back to China. When the Japanese come, he's interned and, and there he dies. But he also, in 1924, became famous for having uh, run a number of races, including the 400 meters or yards or whatever. Um, the, the movie opens um, with him, not quite opens, but comes close to opening with him uh, being on the boat, going over to the Olympics in France. And he is told by his coach or trainer, do you know the first uh, event that you have to run in is on a Sunday? And of course, he goes through all of these machinations, all of these struggles, all of this angst in his heart. And eventually, he goes before the Olympic Committee that included the Prince of Wales and, and Lord somebody this and somebody that. And he said, I cannot do it. I will not run on a Sunday. My Lord forbids it. Now, I'm not convinced that is biblically true, but that was his heart. So we don't need to debate the issues of whether he was right or wrong. The issue for him was, to him, the Sabbath had become a very special time. And to him, as a Christian, from his point of view, he felt he could not engage in something like that. He said he wouldn't run, but actually they arranged for him to run in a different event that wasn't run on a Sunday. And just as he's about to run that, one of the American runners in the same race comes to him with a piece of paper and gives it to him. And just before he takes off in the race, he reads it and it said, they that honor me, I will honor them, says the Lord. Now, I know you can say, well, you mean if we do what we do on the Sabbath and do it right, God will make sure we win a race. If Liverpool players uh, pray more, they'll win more games. No, but it was uh, an underlining of the fact of how important to this man's soul was the issue of having a day in which he could set aside and worship God. Um, I'm going to end with a story about Rio de Janeiro, but before I do, I want to put on the screen um, some statements by Leslie Newbigin about community. Because if we understand community and understand that worship is the community coming together, it's the community honoring the Lord, honoring one another, honoring special times of worship. When we see ourselves as a community, we're not going out of legalism, we're not going out of we ought to, we're going because we want to. And yet at the same time, like Eric Liddell, there's something in us that says, yeah, we may want to, but we are doing it so together we can serve the Lord. Here's what Newbigin says, uh, you can read it, but basically he says, um, the gospel is best understood when people see you not so much going to church, but the, you are a community of men and women who live by it. A community of praise, a community of truth, a selfless community that is involved in the concerns of others, as I saw the Church of the Redeemer. A community to be prepared to live out the gospel in public life. A community of mutual responsibility and not all the individualism and people say, well, I want to do my thing. Um, well, nobody's going to tell me what to do. That's where we're at now with the mask stuff that's going around. It will be a community of hope in a world of pessimism. It will be a community who follows in the way of Jesus by serving the needs of others out of a heart of sacrificial love. I want to tell you of another community. This one is in Brazil. I had spent a couple of weeks uh, in the flavela, uh, not actually in it, very close to it, went into it every day uh, of uh, San Paulo. But as my um, trip ended, I wanted to do a touristy thing, so I went off to Rio de Janeiro. I got myself in a safe hotel uh, near the famous beach down there, and the next day I was going to walk the beach. But the next day was, was uh, I don't know what day it was, it wasn't a Sunday. But I decided I'd do walk about downtown. Somebody told me that wasn't very wise, but I did it. And I came across this huge Catholic church. There were all kinds of people on the steps of the church, um, but inside there was this incredible sound. So I went in and it was packed. It wasn't packed with old folk, and I wasn't that old then. Uh, it was packed with young people absolutely young college students and all the rest of it. Um, 
young professionals. And they had this marvelous service, uh, in, well, they speak their Portuguese, they had this marvelous service in Portuguese. Uh, and you just knew that God was there. So afterwards I went up to the, um, to the priest and spoke to him and he took me to his secretary who spoke better English. And all I wanted to do was take his hand and say, surely God was in this place. This was worship as it's meant to be. I wasn't referring to the language, I wasn't referring to the liturgy, or whether it was Catholic or Baptist, you just knew that these people had come together. And I said, so you hold this occasionally? He said, no, every single day. And if you don't get here by six o'clock in the morning, you won't get a seat. They come, they come streaming in together, singing, singing their praises to God. And that's what I hear in Leviticus 23. That's what I saw in the Church of the Redeemer. That's what I believe God wants us to do in worship. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Sabbath. And it does mean different things to different ones. But we know that what you want it to mean is the people of God coming up together because they've become a community in order to worship you and to be released in that community to all that you have for him. Help us to grow in this for the sake of Jesus. Amen.